Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. If people are standing at the back, please, uh, there are plenty of seats at the front, so uh, you can't find seats at the back. Um, sorry about the slightly late start. We had a few of us running late, myself included. Um, so the, the topic for today's talk is domestic violence, uh, with a particular focus on the Muslim community. And we're very fortunate to have uh, four members on our panel tonight. Um, so we have sitting uh, at the end, we have uh, Anjali Rolf, who uh, was previously assistant editor of Emor magazine, um, and subsequently she's gone on to found, be founder and CEO of Making Her Story, which is a group that campaigns for women's rights. Um, we also have, uh, to my left here, we have uh, Ahmed Udin, who works for the National Sabah Foundation as their head of community relations. And previously to this, he's worked at the Muslim Council of Britain and the Muslim Youth Helpline. Um, then next to, next to Ahmed, we have Julie, who is a survivor of domestic violence and subsequently has gone on to run support groups for women who have been suffering from domestic violence or who have suffered from domestic violence. And then finally, um, in the blue jar here, we have Halda Haq, who is a psychotherapist and clinical supervisor who has worked with a number of Muslim women's groups. So, um, the plan for today is uh, each of the speakers is going to talk for approximately 10 minutes, um, and then after that, we're going to open up the floor to questions. Um, if I could just ask you, when we come to the questions, if you could keep them brief and to the point so that we can try and get through as many as possible. Okay, so without further ado, I'll hand things over to Anjali. Thank you all for having me here tonight, and it's so great to see so many of you, especially um, lots of men in the audience, which is a rarity when I have a budget about domestic violence. Um, I'm not here today um, speaking to you as one of the hundreds and thousands and millions of women who have experienced domestic violence um, perpetrated against them within their own homes, um, like our esteemed speaker Julie here. Um, nor am I here as an expert, um, like Khalida and Ahmed. Um, I'm here today in a different capacity, and it's in a position that I never ever thought that I would find myself in. Um, I'm here today as someone who has suffered an injustice and the unforgivable result <coughs> of having a truly wonderful person taken from me in circumstances that even to this day I still can't fathom. Um, and that's as the relation of a woman who was murdered by a man <coughs> so delusional, um, so possessive, and so controlling that he believed he had the right to take her life rather than her than let her live it free <coughs> from him. The ripple effect of her murder, of any murder, is permanent and it's unending. Her murder, and I use that term specifically, I don't say death, because the word death detracts from the horror of what domestic violence is leading to on a weekly basis, has impacted hundreds of people. It leaves her two beautiful young daughters, my nieces, without a mother, and knowing that their father is a murderer. It leaves the women's shelters, social workers, doctors, solicitors, police officers, judges, anyone else that came into contact with her case, living with the knowledge that they couldn't or didn't do enough to stop her from becoming another headline in another local newspaper. And it leaves everyone that ever knew her from her mother, her brothers and sisters, to new friends that she had met at college, to her driving instructor, her, her daughter's teachers, and of course my own mother and myself, with a daily burden of her absence and with a permanent question in our minds. That question being, what more could we have done to stop her from being killed? I don't have an answer to that question, and none of us that ever knew, knew her ever will. But I do have an answer to this question, and that question being, what can I do to stop someone else from losing someone they love to violence? And that answer is, everything that I possibly can is in that capacity that I'm here today. Now when it comes to domestic violence, and I speak specifically of women being abused by men, it's women who are made most vulnerable and are being murdered most regularly as a result of domestic violence. Most of us will have heard the statistics. Most of us will have heard or read at some point in our lives 
that at least two women a week are killed as a result of violence perpetrated by men, and that's in the UK alone. That's a minimum of eight women a month. And that's 96 women murdered every year. And bear in mind that that's a minimum. That's the number of women expected to be killed within the home <coughs> each year. Since January 1st of this year, 112 women have been killed by men. That's one woman being killed every two and a half days. In America, that figure stands at over 16,000 per year. That's 16,000 women being killed in the US. And rule figures for Southern Asia, China and Russia remain unknown. Now the problem with statistics and numbers and figures is that they serve to desensitize us. They provide us with a masterless face, numbing the, subs the real human faces that lie behind those figures. Now, um, when I entered the room, I very suspiciously, I think, gave some women um, some yellow pieces of paper. Um, in no way in an attempt to embarrass you, can I ask the ladies who have yellow papers numbered one, two, and three to please stand up? Okay. Now, if everyone could just please look at these ladies for 10 seconds. And now imagine that by next Friday, these women no longer exist. They have been killed. And can I ask everyone else with the yellow card to please stand up? Remain standing, please. please stand. Imagine that by the end of this month, actually no, sorry, by the second week of November, these women no longer exist. That is the daily reality of what's going on in the UK with regards to domestic violence and the consequences of what that means for their families and for their loved ones. Thank you so much. Please sit down. These are the faces of some of the 112 women that have been killed this year as a result of domestic violence. And as you can see, their faces belong to every, women of every colour, all ages, race and religion. Domestic violence, gendered violence, relationship abuse, whatever it is that you want to call it, is everywhere. And it takes many forms and many guises. Because at the end of the day, what domestic abuse is really about is control and power. And in order for one person to be powerful, another person not only has to be made powerless, but has to be kept down in that state of powerlessness. So what is domestic violence? As I said, it can take many forms. It can come in the form of coercion, of making a woman do something that she doesn't want to do under the threat of causing her or someone else she loves some form of harm. It can mean emotionally blackmailing her, most often in relation to her children or her parents or someone else within her family, keeping her in the dark about her finances and controlling her with money. It can include getting her into debt and making her pay it off. It can include telling her what to wear, what job she can and cannot do, or belittling her, using body image to humiliate her, ignoring her when she speaks, sexually abusing her, raping her, physically assaulting her, and the classic, blaming her for being so provocative, so stupid, so silly, as to ask for whatever bad treatment she receives. There are, in my humble opinion, Three key reasons why this epidemic of violence against women in every community is so common. To the point where even cases culminating in murder don't even make it into our national papers anymore. The first for me is the terminology. <coughs> when we label violence as domestic, a sideline as a woman's issue, it instantly gives men, and especially men in status of power, the excuse not to listen, and therefore not to act. The irony being, of course, that any form of violence committed by a man upon a woman is a man's issue, it's not a woman's issue. And I have it on good authority from <coughs> fantastic men that I've worked with and lots of TED Talks videos, that as soon as men hear the word domestic, gender, women, abuse, or anything remotely related to women's rights, they switch off. There is a trigger it immediately alienates them from that issue, even though it has everything to do with them. 
Because when you think about it, when it comes to violence against women, it should be men who are up here speaking. It should be men who are taking to the streets and protesting as loudly as the women are against violence being perpetrated by their own fellow men. From New Delhi to New York, we rarely see men take to the streets alongside women, unless it is, of, it is in a case which is too loud and too famous to ignore. But unfortunately, this isn't the case. We have a few good men speaking out about violence and whilst that's all good, it's not great, it's not ideal. Every single man, no matter what community he is from, no matter what religion, no matter what he believes, and especially men in power or considered a peer within the community, needs to make this their number one priority. They need to translate women's issues as men's issues. It is their issues. It affects men and boys as well. The fact that it isn't considered a man's issue brings me on to my second point of why violence against women is so widespread. The way in which women are viewed in every single community inevitably takes how women are going to be treated by that community. Thanks to the internet, lax advertising rules and a growth in porn culture, boys and girls as young as seven are bombarded with images, videos, adverts and messages telling them how women should act what they should look like, and what the roles are in relation to men. <coughs> in a study in 2007, the American Psychological, Psychological Association said that virtually every form of media sexualizes women, and that will come as no surprise to any of us. Now I'm going to take you through kind of a flash image um, scenario. It's going to be very quick. Um, some people may find it a bit risque, but please bear in mind that these are images that you're seeing every day on buses, on your email pop-ups, um, and on the TV. And just consider the image of woman that these adverts are displaying. So if that's what adverts and popular media are telling us that a woman's role is, i.e. a hypersexualized being there to please men, what is the man's role? What are they being told that they, their role is in our society? Now if you look at these kinds of images, the man is the aggressor. He is the one that's controlling the female form. The male sexuality, according to a government commission report, is based on an image of power and aggression. And there's a clear link between these sexualized images and tendency to view women as objects and the acceptance of aggressive attitudes. Trivializing and glamorizing violence against women is another obstacle to why women's issues are not considered men's issues. Nigella Lawson and the recent Oscar Pretorius trial, while sparking outrage, gives us an insight into the language that surrounds domestic violence and how it is viewed by wider society. And whilst the lax way in which violence and the stalking and harassment of women is portrayed in popular media platforms like music videos, and I don't know if most of you have seen the recent Maroon 5 video, and there's been a huge backlash against it, um, where the singer is basically stalking his girlfriend, in real life it's his wife, um, leading to a kind of scene in a, um, one of those meat hanging um, rooms. Um, and it's, it's a very bloody, gory um, end to a video. Um, and this is hit number one. Um, and the lyrics are, Baby, I'm praying on you tonight, hunt you down, eat you alive, just like animals. Maybe you think that you can hide. I can smell your scent for miles, just like animals. And then, of course, there was the outrage over Beyonce's own 
um, lyrics with regards to Eat the Cake anime, which refer to Tina Turner's own um, experiences of abuse in relation to Ike Turner. These are all lyrics, these are all things that are being seen and heard by young people today and being in, in digested. This belittling of violence targeted to women is being mimicked on various platforms across the world. From Facebook, and these are real Facebook pages which we have been campaigning to take down, where violence against women is made fun of um, and trivialised, to men's magazines which encourage men to smash anything that moves, um, if a bird falls for you, you know, and she turns the tables and breaks her heart, of course the other option is to cut your ex's face and no one will want her. This was in um, Zoo and it got retracted um, following um, a huge outcry. And then you have video games. Now I don't know if um, any of you heard about this, but um, a year ago um, the game uh, Lara Croft it featured a scenario where she could be raped. Um, and there was a huge outcry um, and finally, I hope, I don't know for sure, but the gaming industry did reply and said that they would pull that scenario. And these are games that are being played by our young boys and girls. So what happens after you trivialise sex and gender-based violence um, is to do the ultimate act of blame, shifting the blame. From blaming, from moving the blame from men's shoulders onto women, you make it their <coughs> priority. You blame them. You tell you tell them that it's their fault they drank too much that night, or it's their fault they were they're wearing too short a skirt. We have now reached a point where last year, Cosmopolitan magazine released a rape survival guide for new undergraduates at selected universities. This was issued to only girls. And this year, both Oxford and Cambridge have released and delivered compulsory sexual consent workshops so that men and women can understand that no actually means no. And the final reason for why violence against women has reached this state is silence. Malcolm X said that in the end we'll remember not the words of our enemies but the silence of our friends. With regards to my own aunt's case, she was told time and time again not to speak about what she had been through. The backlash that I have received on a personal front from talking about my aunt's case and for launching Making Her History again reiterates to myself just how close our community is when it comes to domestic violence. The shame is not the woman's, it is the man's. And it is we as a community who have to stand up and say that this is enough. No matter what background, race, religion a woman is from, we each have an opportunity and an obligation, especially as Muslims, to stand up and say, no, I will defend you. So what can you do? What can you, as the ordinary Joe on the ground, do? You can, as men, men here, you can not laugh at jokes that are sexist. You can stand up to any kind of form, any form of violence that you see within your home. You can support us, your fellow women, when we go out and we march, and we protest, and we write, and we stand here and we talk about the experiences that we are going through. The men in our community are a party, they're a key party to why domestic violence continues. And we cannot do this without you. Don't ignore the signs. Do all you can to listen. I set up making history with a vow that if I could just save one more life before I died, then my life's work would be done. We have all sorts of informal platforms. There are millions and millions of women out there doing amazing works against domestic violence. Join them. Don't think of it as an issue that has nothing to do with you. It is happening in every single town and village in the world. It has something to do with you. So come and join us in our movements. Um, I'm not going to go down the Emma Watson line and say, you know, we invite you. Um, you know what your roles are. You know your powers. Everyone can do something, and no action is too small, and you might just save a life. Um, thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Anthony. So now I'm going to pass you over to Amit from the National Zakat Foundation. So, in the month of Ramadan, I get
get a call. I couldn't pick up because I was driving. So, uh, literally a minute later, I get the same call, the same person calling me. And still, I was driving, so I couldn't pick up. And the calls kept on coming, kept on coming. And I thought, you know, let me park up the car and let me take this phone call. I pick up the phone and speak to an applicant of the National Sakar Foundation. And she's speaking to me in Bengali, in Sileti, and telling me that I was around the area of where my ex husband, well, she didn't know her ex husband had moved to this area. But I was around a block of flats where my ex husband saw me. He managed to grab me, take me to my house, but take, to, take, take me to his house, lock the door, and in Ramadan, in daylight hours, tried to rape me. For a moment I was thinking, okay, it's very serious what she's, she's telling me over the phone, but why am I the first person she's calling? I said, sister, you need to call 999, have you called the police? She said, no, I haven't called the police. I said, why not? Why haven't you done that? She goes, because of my immigration status, I'm not too sure what might happen. Because if the police come and intervene, they might realise that I'm an overstay or whatever my status is. And I end up in, in prison myself and then probably shipped back to Bangladesh. Anyway, I convinced her to speak to the police and I helped her to kind of get out of the flat that she was stuck in. Now imagine that scenario where you're in the month of Ramadan when her husband, who's also a so called Muslim, who should be fasting, is attempting rape. She's got no friends, no family. She's an alien to the country. She doesn't speak the language. She's scared of her immigration status. Imagine what's going through her head. Just imagine that. And then she's calling me to kind of get assistance with the most basic things that everyone knows, that we take for granted, that wherever you are, you either call 911, depending where you are, or 999. She's calling me as first protocol. Now, as the National Scout Foundation, we receive calls from victims of domestic violence on a daily basis. We are linked to various women's aid charities around the country who are calling us on a day in, day out basis. I get calls in the middle of the night from police officers saying that we are having a victim of domestic violence, she needs emergency accommodation, etc. etc. Now, Think about the situation where individuals who are actually born and bred in this country who speak the language, who, are, who, who have qualifications, who hold a job, who go through this experience, where they don't know what to do or they accept the fact that they are to be beaten. And I was recently really shocked to kind of come across a, a case that came forward to the National Zakat Foundation when when the name, when I heard it, I was like, is that the same person that I know? I inquired a little bit more and found out it is the same person. And this same person was married to a friend of mine. And she's been suffering domestic violence at his hands for many years. I remember going to his wedding. And he was a lovely guy from what I know. She's a single mother, a PhD student and suffering domestic violence, and she was scared. Now this is an individual who knows, who knows the system inside out. Now what complicates her situation is the fact that she can't go back to her family, which when she goes back to her family, her family is going to say, well, it's your duty to serve your husband, and if you dare come back, who will beat you up? Now she was in this dilemma for many years, where she wasn't going back to her house because her brothers were would batter her just as her husband would batter her. She was dependent upon her husband, she had a child, and she didn't just want to disrupt her studies, despite the fact that she was going through violence. This is the living reality of many Muslims in this country, and many individuals. Now, let's, let's reverse the case. Now, we've been speaking about women so far, but we actually get cases of men that are facing domestic violence. So I get a call from a brother who's passing by in the city of Birmingham and said, look, I come across this individual who's lying on a park bench, his eyes swollen up, he can't walk properly, he's limping. 
can you help him out? He seems to be homeless. He seems to be homeless for, for a while now. Speak to him. I said, what's the situation, brother? He goes, I'm homeless. I've got no food. I can't hold a job. I just had an operation, and my doctors advised me that I need to be indoors. And if I'm not indoors, I might lose my eyesight. And I've got nowhere to go. I've got no money. My legal status is in limbo as well. So I said to him, okay, we'll put, you in up, we'll put you up in emergency accommodation, we'll take care of all your emergency needs, and then we'll look to see how we can support you in the long run. Which we did, which we did. But the reality is that he was brought over, he, he, he came to the UK because he wanted to come to the UK to earn a living so that he can support his family and support his family back home in Bangladesh. Now, he had come to the UK by selling all that he had, all his ancestral land, all his ancestral home, everything was put on this. Now, he couldn't contemplate going back to Bangladesh. He worked in a restaurant, his wife kept him in that limbo of, well, I'm not going to sort your immigration status up if you don't give me the funds. She used his funds to buy a house under her name, and she would, with her sisters and her mother and her father, would beat this guy up. And he suffered in silence for all these years until a point when he came home to find that his wife was holding uh, parties at, at his house while he was working in a restaurant with, with men from all sorts of background. And what they were doing was sleeping around, drinking alcohol, and whatnot. He later realized that he actually trans he got sexually transmitted diseases from his wife because she was sleeping around like this. There was a point that he couldn't bear anymore, so he left. <coughs> but the situation was that he he was in a situation where he was homeless. His immigration status was, in, status was in limbo. He couldn't work because of the fact that he was in in the condition that he was. Um, and these are cases again that happen on a day in day out basis. So, you know, what can we do? Well, what really is the situation here? That we, why do we need to tackle this in, in, in a time where people are talking about all sorts of rights and human rights and so many different organisations out there? Why do we have this crisis at hand? I mean, there's, for me, like, when we're dealing with situations like this, where the first three things that come to my mind is that why on earth are men or women doing this to the spouses? <coughs> Secondly, the emergency support that we need to give these individuals. Now, when we talk about emergency support, we talk about accommodation, we talk about food, we talk about clothing, we talk about counselling, we talk about looking at immigration status, and anything else that comes. And remember, a lot of these individuals that do come to the National Zakat Foundation have these language barriers, no friends and family. And then in the long-term support, how do you provide support to these individuals? so that they can be self-sufficient, living a dignified life. Because it's all good, like, you know, you, there are legal kind of rooms, like, where you can put these individuals who have no legal status, and you can put them through the kind of legal channel and get their immigration status sorted out. Having different leaves to remain, be on the benefit, get housing benefit, get social housing. But that doesn't really resolve the problem. Because if they're single mothers, they can't go to work. They probably can't work because of language barriers. They've probably got no skills. They've got no friends and family to help them emotionally. So how do you support them in the long term? These are the things that kind of like going through my head when I'm dealing with the case. Now look, there's various reasons why, like, you know, the social scientists have scientists have done various studies to kind of figure out, you know, why is this happening, you know. And some some have said, you know, socioeconomic, patriarchal society, um, you know, economic disempowerment. And some use the Quran verse, the wife beating verse, Surah 4, verse 34. Now, if you go back to Ottoman times where there was a case brought forward to a judge where the wife is complaining to the judge that my husband beat me up, he knocked out two, uh, three two. And the, the husband is saying, Well, in the Quran, it says, I can strike my wife if I go through these channels as a last resort. So the judge had both sides of the story. And the judge ruled in the favour of the wife and said, not only do you have the right for divorce, but you as the husband need to pay compensation 
to the wife because you have hit her. Because in Islamic Sharia, when you strike someone, you're supposed to give them compensation. So you have to give them compensation, and she has a right to divorce, and she can walk away from this. Because what I've got this Quranic verse in front of me, you know, I can beat my wife. Because look, that Quranic verse is that Quranic verse, but so many hadiths that come into con put into context to kind of make that Quran verse to understand what it means. It's not as black and white as you see here. There's numerous translations that you will see in the classical text does not mean you strike when you mean strike. And that, that's the classical uh, interpretation of these verses. And you'd be shocked. We get cases from, from the wives of imams, marriage counselors in this country. And they say, I can't speak out. Because no one would believe me, all these, his friends will come and beat me up because he's a well-known individual. He's the imam of such and such mosque. He knows X, Y, and Z people. So, where did we go? So, why National Zakat Foundation and why Zakat? So, just to, just to give a brief outline of who we are and what we do, there's flies at the back of the table, uh, my colleague. Uh, Asif Sia, who works um, as the head of distribution at the National Zakat Foundation. So if you've got further questions, you can approach me and Asif. But we are using Zakat as a means to bring about social justice in, in the case of domestic violence uh, to Muslims in the UK. And we've been uh, not only kind of helping individuals on an individual basis, but we've also created centres where we are creating centres for transformational uh, change. So where transformation can take place. We have shelters for Muslim women, three so far, one in London, one in Birmingham, one in Manchester, where individuals who need specialist support, individuals that are spoken about, can come into these shelters and they will be given, hold, held their hand and given all the support they need. And in reality, what we have is not enough. Because as the moment a sister leaves the shelter, there's probably another three, four women that want to come into the project. And we have delivered, uh, we're delivering these projects in conjunction with some of the biggest and largest DV agencies, homelessness charities in the country. And we realize, we realize that the demand is much higher and we need to have these shelters propping up in every major city in the UK. Um, if you have any further questions, please uh, feel, to, feel free to approach me and ask it later on. I don't want to take too much time because uh, I know we have some esteemed speakers and I felt, I really felt the burden of speaking speak on behalf of men uh, on this panel, so I'm glad that I was representing men here. Subordinate 
and or dependent by isolating them from sources of support, exploiting their resources and capacities for personal gain, depriving them of the means needed for independence, resistance and escape, and regulating their everyday behaviour. Coercive behaviour is uh, defined as an act or an act, a pattern of acts of assault, threats, humiliation and intimidation or other abuse that is used to harm, punish or frighten their victim. And you can see from the example that Anjali gave and also from Ahmed that these were very much features of those cases. Um, but I'd like to move on to the children. Obviously, um, in terms of um, children witnessing uh, domestic violence, uh, it's something like 75% of reported cases the child is actually a witness to the incident. And 90% of cases, they're either in the same room or the next room. Now imagine yourself as a child. Imagine your imagination and have what you, you can hear your parents fighting, you know, you know screaming, screaming, throwing things, you know, um, all sorts of noises going on. What's going on in your head? It's not a, it's not a nice place to be for a child. But these are some of the effects on children uh, as a consequence of domestic violence. Uh, the first thing I've put down is social isolation, uh, stigma, and keeping secrets. Often um, children feel as an extension of uh, their parents keeping a secret that they have to keep it secret. And so they aren't very good at making friends. Um, and so they haven't got anybody to speak to. And um, in fact, I think uh, when Julie gives her talk, uh, she'll touch on um, that issue in terms of her own experience. Um, they also experience emotional neglect and abuse. Now, if a mother is unable to look after her child because she's been beaten, or she isn't in a place, she's so depressed where she can't sort of look after herself, let alone her child, you know, this is going to occur in terms of emotional neglect. Now, in terms of abuse, sometimes what happens is um, with mothers, sort of chain of um, violence can move down the line. So if the father is abusing the mother, sometimes the mother is abusing the child. Then we have uh, behavioural changes and problems. Um, it's, uh, you know, I guess that sort of makes sense, you know, uh, a child can start uh, wetting the bed or being more aggressive or all sorts of things. I mean, um, the list is endless in terms of what can happen to a child. There's developmental delay. Um, a child can often, in terms of their speech, they can delay educationally, they can do a there's some link between autism and uh, the mother's um, sort of well-being. So that's, uh, in terms of re reproductive abuse, I've called it reproductive abuse because um, what it is, is uh, what I'm trying to say here is that sometimes what happens is that in terms of controlling things, the, the abuser can often um, stop any form of uh, contraception being available to the woman. And so children are born that might not be born into the situation, but also you get the opposite where they are forced into having abortions as a consequence of the father not wanting it. And so children are either born because they're not, you know, out of no fault of their own, obviously, and or also being killed as a out of no fault of their own. Often there's overly punitive discipline in um, homes where there's domestic violence, so children are disciplined harshly. The child grows up feeling fearful and responsible. Um, I have a case where um, I work with uh, perpetrators of uh, domestic violence, and the father, one of the fathers, was saying that actually his five-year-old child will come in when he hears she hears um, raised voices. She will come in and step in between the parents and say, "Don't shout." You know, so that's a five-year-old. You know, should a five-year-old be stepping in between parents and saying, "You know, please be quiet." Um, they have disrupted play and leisure time. I mean, if mum's not well enough to take them anywhere, if dad's not sort of involved, sort of, um, they're not going to have sort of uh, very nice play 